This investigation is sponsored by King Art Games. There is a common legend across the peoples of Europa. It tells of three brothers who led their starving and desperate people across the deepest wilds of the continent. At first, they traveled together, taking refuge beneath the same sky and speaking with one another in the same tongue. But the longer they traveled, the more distant they became. First to depart was the eldest brother, who along with his tribe, departed for the vast steppes of the east where he saw the wind was blowing freely. The second brother and his tribe were next to leave, seeking out the fertile lands beneath the towering peaks of the west. The youngest brother continued north, but found little with which to feed his people. Until one day, as the sun began to set, he came upon a broad valley, marked by sparkling rivers each teeming with fish and surrounded by beautiful lands with no equal in the world. The tribe of the youngest brother rested there, while he alone set out to hunt. It was not long before he spotted one of the beasts of the forest, but as he made ready to loose an arrow, a shadow fell over the youngest brother. He had unknowingly taken aim beneath the nest of an immense white eagle, which, as crimson light filled the valley, spread its wings against the setting sun. The details of this story change with every telling. The identity of the three brothers and what lands they settled have all been wrapped in myth and lost to antiquity. But a great white eagle casting its wings against a crimson sky can still be seen across Europa. Now, however, it is emblazoned on the flags and banners of the Republic of Polania. Situated in the center of the vast plains that cut across Europa, Polania has always been a crossroads of intersecting tribes and cultures. The establishment of Polanyan statehood can be traced to the pagan kings of the Middle Ages, who turned their paltry holdings into a realm of cohesive territory. This growing kingdom embraced a union with foreign rulers to the north, creating a grand commonwealth that for a time presided over Europa as one of its largest and most populous nations. It built a uniquely liberal political system, enshrined in the continent's first written national constitution. But with time came the passing of prominence and prosperity. The country had few natural borders with which to defend itself and found itself caught between the rise of rival superpowers. Both the Rusviet Zardom to the east and the Saxon kingdoms to the west would invade and occupy Polania, partitioning it among themselves. Multiple times across its history, Polania would reclaim the mantle of independence, only to be conquered again by one or both of its rivals. But since the famed uprising of 1863, which saw Rusviet armies thrown back from its borders, Polania has once again been an independent nation. But while the nation yearns to restore Polania's now long distant golden age, it has proved powerless in the face of renewed aggression. Much of the country's border territories remain occupied, and the government is desperate to keep the current armistice intact, regardless of whatever conditions it is forced to endure. While some rage at the apparent inaction of their government, Polania is unique among the nations of Eastern Europa in the voice it gives its people. A parliamentary democracy, executive power is held by the office of the president. The powers this office wields are limited. While able to appoint both a prime minister to head the government and the upper house of the nation's senate, it is the support of the lower house that is required to pass laws and enact policy. The Polanyan Senate is split between various political parties, representing not only competing ideologies, but often minority groups, including Saxons and Rossoviets, who live within the country. The nation was also one of the first in the world to recognize women's suffrage, and a greater percentage of Polanyan citizens can cast their vote than nearly anywhere else in Europa. 
but frequently changing governments, accusations of corruption, and weariness left over from the losses of the Great War have led to a severe lack of confidence among the common people. The potential for the rise of a new Polanyan autocracy is growing, through either a military coup or even fair and honest elections. Much of this is driven by the country's economic difficulties. The bloodiest battles of the Great War were fought across Polanya, and the nation's industries were exploited or sabotaged by either the Tsardom or Saxons in equal measure. Even before the outbreak of war, the Republic had been tasked with unifying disparate economic regions, which had previously been administered by different countries. Within the nation's borders were the remnants of different economic systems and different currencies, with very few direct institutional links. While great progress had been made in centralizing the economy and easing the disparity of wealth across its regions, the renewed occupation of its frontier territories has reversed much of it. Frequent border closures and blockades by both Saxony and Rusvia have only worsened the situation, with some regions of Polania faced with starvation. The nation has also been traditionally agrarian, with most of its modern heavy industries built by Saxon occupiers. Major projects initiated prior to the start of the war included the construction of entirely new industrial cities together with rail lines and seaports. These were meant to bypass occupied areas and have the potential to bring Polania new opportunities for trade and wealth but these developments were heavily impacted by the war and remain easily disrupted. Worse still, the uneven distribution of these advancements has unofficially divided the country into parts, the better developed West and the underdeveloped East. Together, all these factors are contributing to a rising social unrest. This dissatisfaction has spread to the armed forces, split between those who favor the liberation of occupied territories and those who wish to preserve the armistice. How Polania might fare in any future conflict remains unknown. The nation has worked to field a considerable army of nearly one million soldiers on active duty, organized into numerous infantry divisions, supported by cavalry and mechanized brigades. Another 700,000 serve in the reserves, mainly veterans from the Great War. The training of the Polanyan army is thorough. Its non-commissioned officers in particular are highly regarded across Europa, possessing expert knowledge and high ideals. Since the end of the Great War, fearing a renewed conflict, a special emphasis has been placed on training. This routinely occurs both in the field and in the lecture hall where modern technical achievements have been closely studied, discussed, and demonstrated. Yet the eagerness to supply its armies with the mechanized walkers made famous by Nikola Tesla has been stymied by budget difficulties. New models have been introduced slowly and often in numbers well below what is required. Unable to compete with the technical sophistication of the Empire of Saxony or the raw power of the Rusviet Tsardom, Polania has instead embraced a doctrine centered upon mobility. Its mechs are lighter and faster, able to quickly engage in hit-and-run tactics designed to keep the enemy at a distance. The PMZ-7 Smearly is perhaps the best representation of Polanyan doctrine, lightly armored but equipped with a powerful anti-mech rifle and able to move swiftly. A revolutionary design at the outbreak of the Great War it remains competitive years later, and even the oldest models have been kept in service. It has been especially successful when deployed alongside cavalry divisions, supporting Polanyan mounted infantry as a kind of modern iteration of the famed winged hussars. The PZM-9 Strasnik represents another uniquely Polanyan innovation, a fast walker with advanced stabilization technologies that allow it to fire while on the move. Such advancements come at the cost of firepower, however, with the PZM equipped only with lighter machine guns. Despite the effectiveness of these mechs in the mobile operations favored by the Polanyan army, heavier, slower, more powerful designs have not been wholly overlooked. The PZM-13 Mokni 
is essentially a walking artillery piece. Equipped with a heavy gun, the equal of anything found in the arsenals of Polanyi's major rivals. It is the PZM-24 Tur, however, that is the pride of the Republic. Designed as much for its potency in wartime as for its formidable presence in peacetime, the PZM-24 is believed to be the largest mech in regular service across the whole of Europa. Such behemoths have put a considerable strain on Polanyan industry, however, and have been deployed only in very limited numbers. It is perhaps the presence of these new technologies that has emboldened certain elements of the Polanyan army to test the limits of the armistice. A growing resistance has formed in the occupied territories, desperate, angry people who have refused to give in to the weariness and timidity that has gripped both their government and their countrymen. In isolated towns and farms, they have seized any opportunity to strike back at foreign occupiers, before melting away into the thick forests of their homeland. The Polanyan government has sought to end these border skirmishes before they reignite the horrors of the Great War. The increasing sophistication of the attacks, and the presence of modern military equipment among the ranks of the resistance, however, lends evidence to the idea that regular units of the Polanyan army have begun training, supplying, and perhaps fighting alongside them. Many attribute this to the presence of the war hero Lech Kos at the head of the leadership of the resistance. His aggressive and fearless style of command during the Great War inspired unrivaled acts of bravery in the men under his command. While he remains especially popular within sections of the armed forces, the current government considers him to be the most dangerous man in Polania. If he can rouse the general populace to follow his example, then perhaps the means to overthrow the Rusviet occupiers might be within reach. There is hardly a cause more noble than in the liberation of one's homeland, and it is easy to deride the current government as weak and timid. But the time when three brothers marched together across the untamed wilderness of Europa as one united tribe is long gone. It has been replaced by a new age of mechanical constructs and terrible weaponry, with the power to unleash carnage on a scale never seen. It was not so long ago that the cities of Polania were consumed by fire, and armies of its native sons and daughters were massacred in the fields and forests. Perhaps, however, the burning passion to resist is all that is required, and while its lands may be occupied, its armies crushed, as long as that fire burns, Polania is not yet lost. Thanks to King Art Games for sponsoring this investigation into the occupied yet still defiant territories of Polania. Additionally, Thank you to both the writing team over at King Art Games and Jacob Rosalski for allowing the Templin Institute to contribute a few small details to the universe of 1920+. Polania is one of three great nations that you can lead to glory in Iron Harvest, a real-time strategy game that's out right now. If you'd like to lead fierce resistance fighters to rid the land of foreign occupiers, you'll find a link to where you can buy the game in the video description.